Well, here we are, another year come and gone, and I just realized that I wore this same shirt <laughs> in the video from last year too, so I, I don't know what to do with that, but whatever, cool, it's tradition now. But this year wound up being different than I anticipated in terms of, you know, books and stuff I read, because it started off really, really strong. Like, the first couple books I read this year were, like, the last uh, part of the Broken Empire trilogy, and Orconomics, and so I was thinking, yeah, this is gonna be great. But around springtime, so not long after I moved, it started to go downhill precipitously. Well, that sucks! And weirdly enough, as you'll see later, I read several book series that followed that exact pattern, you know, starting off strong and then just completely collapsing by the end. I don't know why that is, but hey, I felt the need to mention it, and to, to be honest, I feel like I... <laughs> I just read too much damn young adult stuff this year. Like, it's what the audience demands, so sometimes you gotta give the people what they want, but man, I watched too much, or I read too much YA stuff this year. <laughs> that said, there's plenty of stuff to enjoy this year, and there was plenty of stuff to mock this year, and there's plenty of stuff that, I don't know, you just, you think, you read it and you think about it and go, huh, that's weird. Uh, so let's do that, and also keep in mind that this is just stuff I read this year. This isn't necessarily stuff that came out this year. And also, if I mention something, there will probably be spoilers, so just be aware. But yeah, let's uh, do best and worst of 2023. Let's go. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So the biggest letdown of this year by a pretty big margin was The Lost Metal. And technically I did start reading this one at the end of last year, but I didn't finish it until this year and it wasn't featured in last year's list so fuck it it's 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 <laughs> it's here this time uh yeah the lost metal it was um not horrible but there was about six years of hype behind it you know because uh, there was six years between the bands of mourning and the lost metal and the bands of mourning had an insane ending which made people super excited and we just wanted to know what happened next. We wanted to know how Wax and Wayne's storyline would uh, get wrapped up and how that would possibly lead into the greater Cosmere bit. But it, um, it, it wasn't that, you know? The whole thing really just felt like it was a commercial for more Cosmere stuff. And that's a big part of why I haven't been reading much Cosmere stuff lately is because, like, I haven't touched any of the secret projects or anything yet. Like, I'm, I'm not saying I'll never read them. I just... I'm not that excited for him, partially because in the, the not just Lost Metal, but a couple books before that as well, it just feels less and less like these are self-contained stories which tie together in some ways and more like just, hey, look, we're going to do cool stuff later. If you don't understand this reference, then this isn't going to make sense, but if you do, then it's really cool. And it's just, it's just getting more and more annoying and obnoxious, and I'm not into it. And the Lost Metal, even on as its own thing, it's good, again, pr pretty good, solid conclusion, but it doesn't really feel like it's meant as a conclusion, it feels like it's just advertising other stuff. The weirdest book I read this year, no contest, it was Struck by Jennifer Bosworth, <laughs> and this one is, I mean, it's about a girl that's addicted to being struck by lightning, and I mean, I, I say that, I'll, and you're gonna wonder what happens next. And what happens next? Well, there's two cults, there's a massive earthquake which destroys most of Los Angeles, there's people who have weird X-Men powers, there's a skyscraper with an eternal rave to celebrate the end of the world. Like, it's people just partying, going, yep, we're all gonna die soon, might as well make the most of it. And that's, like, a major part of the end of the book, the climax of the book. Okay. It, just, what am I meant to do with that? Like, I, and don't get me wrong, I like Struck. You can go watch my video on it if you don't believe me. I liked Struck. It's a good book. It unfortunately leaves itself very open for sequels and seems to be baiting sequels really hard, but we're never going to get any because the author not only has remarried and changed her name, but she's also just not interested in being an author anymore, it seems. She's working on other stuff, which, you know, good for her, but... It's been like 12 years, we're, we're never getting more struck, but yeah, good or bad, it was the strangest thing I read this year. The runner-up for the strangest thing I read this year was Breathe, and its sequel, Resist, by Sarah Croissant. I, I described this book in my review of it as an edgy Lorax ripoff, and 
yeah, that's basically it. It's like humans destroyed all the trees, so now there's not enough oxygen for people, and so now they just live under big domes, and they have to pay for air. Like, that's just... That's a thing that happens, and that is the plot of the Lorax movie. And even outside of the main premise, it's just a strange book series with strange things happening. Like, apparently, oh, okay, outside you actually can breathe, you just have to condition yourself to do it, so you have to get used to having less oxygen, or how there's a cult, except the cult is kind of not evil, but they kind of are evil, and then no one is sure who the villains even are in the final battle, it's just, there's a big final battle, it's, it's a weird and not particularly good book series, but it's, it's not as weird as Struck. The best nonfiction I read this year was easily Street Sword. Practical use of the long blade for self-defense. Stupid light is reflecting weird. There you go. Practical use of the long blade for self-defense by Phil Elmore. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep meaning to do a video with this, but uh, I haven't gotten the chance to. And the only reason that's the best nonfiction I read this year, it really should be this one, Black Flags, The Rise of Isis, because this is a fascinating book, but I'm not finished with it yet, so I don't think it would be right to put it on the list. So, Street Sword, that's the best nonfiction this year. The funniest book series I read this year is easily the Flintstones comic from 2016, because... <laughs> Man, even just thinking about it for a little while makes me chuckle. Like, seeing all the weird stone punk technology in the Flintstones was always amusing, always gave me a couple of laughs, even when I was a little kid. But seeing that done to an even greater degree here, and with even more modern technology done in a stone punk version, is great here. But on top of that, it's also just very biting political slash social satire, like, especially if you look at it uh, based on what was going on in the United States politically back in 2016. This is a, there's some pretty clear parallels here, which it's making fun of, uh, and it's all just in a weird setting, so there is some separation between that and the real world, which helps prevent it from feeling like it's, you know, being preachy or anything. And even outside of that, there's some great jokes here. Like, there's a soldier with PTSD who calls the suicide help line, and they put him on a hold as soon as he calls, and he says, all right, but this better be some damn good hold music. Like, just, you know, there's some really good jokes in there. Runner-up for the funniest book I read this year is easily Swoon, because Swoon is a stealth parody of Twilight. Uh, like, you know, there was Twilight with sexy vampires and then a whole bunch of other books ripping off Twilight about sexy boys who were some other supernatural creature. Sometimes they, it was just vampires, other times it was like fairies or leprechauns or werewolves or whatever. And Swoon is, a, a, again, it's a stealth parody. It doesn't really advertise itself as such, so it might be a little while before it becomes obvious. But it, instead of being about sexy vampires, it's about a sexy ghost who later turns into a sexy golem, and he tries to get revenge on people by making old people have orgies and stuff. Like, it's... Swoon is a hilarious book. It's not for everybody, I don't think, but it's a hilarious book. I loved it. The book series I read with by far the most missed potential this year, and if you've seen my video on it, it should not be hard to guess what this is. It's Red Queen. You know, again, not a good cover here. I've seen people describe these covers as great. I don't know what they're talking about. I think Red Queen's covers are terrible. But whatever, that's just me. And I'm not here to talk about the covers either. I'm talking about the missed potential because it's a pretty basic setup for a story. Just, okay, a girl discovers she has magical powers and is going to be made one of the elite nobility who run the country, but she has to hide who she really is. And then there's also a rebellion that goes off. Like that... That's a pretty basic setup for a story, but there are so many points where it brings up the possibility for doing something really cool, not even necessarily unique, but at the very least interesting or something that would be fun to read about or something that would be cool to read about or at the very least just, you know, something. Something beyond the absolute most basic surface level stuff. They have so many opportunities to do that. They could go into detail about things like the morality of war and terrorism, because there are parts where, yeah, the main characters do some unpleasant stuff, but they don't really dwell on it. Or the trauma that all this violence could happen, or excuse me, that all this violence could inflict upon not only the main character, but other characters as well. Or how about uh, the Silvers, the ruling class of this world, uh, actually being puppets of other people. Like, I thought that was going to be an actual thing here, or at least I thought that would be cool, and just nothing 
nothing happens, you know? Red Queen was really just obsessed with writing tropes and then only giving them the barest of explanations and uh, justifications for why those tropes exist, but not really doing anything else, you know? There, there's no subversion, there's no surprises, there's, there, there's nothing. There's nothing there, and that's part of why I disliked it so much. The biggest shock I had this year was realizing that Servants of Fate is erotica. <laughs> now, Servants of Fate was something I read earlier on this year, and I'll tell you right now, it's a good book series, or at least a, a decent book series, because I did like the actual story of it, and there's some of the characters and stuff who I, were, I was really into as well, the world it takes place in is kind of interesting, but it is just erotica. You know, like, a little while into the first book, I, when it was going into a lot of detail and spending a lot of time describing characters, like, genitals and stuff, I was like, okay, I think this might, this might be smutty erotica s such stuff. Uh, what's going on here? And then the first sex scene came, and I was like, okay, yeah, that, this, is, this is basically just porn. And, you know, it, the story and everything could have been better, but overall I did enjoy it. Uh, it's just, it really caught me off guard because it wasn't advertised as erotica. The most boring fantasy I read this year, I don't know if I'd call it the worst, but by far the most boring, is Leviathan by R.M. Huffman. And, man, this is another one that had at least some potential to be cool and interesting, but it just did nothing with it. Because it's literally just a Bible freak rewrote the story of Noah, but then sucked out all of the character all of the theme, all intrigue, and most of the action. You know, like, there there really is nothing there that is interesting. Like, it, the only reason that someone would like the character of Noah, as he's portrayed there, is if you're already a weirdo religious person who is just obsessed with Noah and thinks, yes, he is amazing, he is God's chosen person, he's, he's the best ever, we love Noah, isn't that right? Like, it... That there's no reason to actually like him, but the story just accepts that you do like him and look up to him. So rather than seeing somebody go on some sort of journey and do stuff that's great, he just is great, you know? And so for that reason, Leviathan was the most boring fantasy I read. The book series with the biggest drop in quality from beginning to end, shouldn't shock you if you've seen my video on it, it just came out a couple days ago, is Everneath, of course. <laughs> if you haven't watched my video on this, go, go do that. I know it's long, but just go please go do it because I need to justify spending that much time on it and man the first book wasn't perfect it had some issues in there which I pointed out but it was the first book was a cute romance with some tragedy and a you know an actual story where the characters were working towards some sort of goal and overall they were decent people except for the villain but then in the later books a magical rapist turns out to be the love interest, and the main character literally kills thousands of people and never even acknowledges or thinks about the fact that she did that. That is in no way an exaggeration. Go watch my video if you don't believe me. It was, it, it was nuts. And so, yeah, th this book series started off as genuinely good. I enjoyed it. But by the end, it's one of the worst things I touched this year. It was horrible. The runner-up for the biggest drop in quality from a book series this year, from beginning to end, was the Dustlands trilogy, aka Blood Red Road, because the first book is just called Blood Red Road. And again, the first book is just like Everneath, it's really solid. It starts off with a girl witnessing her brother get kidnapped, and her father is killed by these strange men that come to their home, and she sets off to rescue her brother. Like, it's a simple... Uh, goal that she's working towards and she has to go through a lot of trouble to get there. And again, the first book isn't perfect, but it is a good adventure story where we're following this young girl who's thrust into very difficult circumstances and is fighting against horrifying odds just to save her loved one. You know, it's, it's great. And the end of it is still open for sequels, obviously, but it does wrap up the story pretty well. And then we get into the second and third books and it's about this weird half-assed revolution and then at the very end they literally defeat the villain by pointing out to his followers that the villain's son is deaf. Again, if you want context, you're gonna have to go watch that. But, like, you, you know, it's just, it started off as good and then it just loses all steam, it loses its own identity. And just like Everneath, 
the, the two of them have some weird similarities because they're both trilogies. They're both were following trends in the young adult market at the time that they came out. And they both started good and then, you know, fell off, obviously. And then they both feature a love triangle between the main character, who is a girl, and two men. And in both cases, one of the men that they're in a love triangle with is named Jack, and both of them choose Jack and are in a relationship with him at the end of the ser series. Like, that's... That, that, there's weird similarities here, is what I'm saying. That's weird. The best science fiction I read this year goes to the Empire of Man series by David Weber and John Ringo. And this one, it, again, it's a simple enough setup. It's about a prince of a galactic empire who gets stranded on a planet full of barbarians alongside his marine bodyguards, and they have to literally walk to the other end of this planet uh, so that they can reach a spaceport, and then they have to take over that spaceport so that they can commandeer a ship and go home. And this, this isn't really spoilers, because they bring that up, like, before they even uh, land on the planet as they're running away. They're like, okay, that's our plan. And then it takes them three books to go through it, and then even once they get off the planet, there's still some more issues they gotta deal with once they get home. So, like, it, it's a very personal story following uh, just a couple of people in any real depth, but it's still very expansive because you see how they're affecting entire civilizations, but both when they're, you know, just a relatively small group on this planet and once they go out and start affecting the entire empire. I really loved it because, like, it's, it's pretty clearly military science fiction, yes, but it's also a space opera. And it's been a long time since we've had... Well, okay, I was about to say it's been a long time since we've had a proper space opera, and that's not true. We've had a couple over the past few decades, but it's been a long time since we had a lot of good ones, you know? And I, if more people would take advice from stuff like Empire of Man or The Expanse, then yeah, we, we'd be in a good place. The worst romance I read this year, again, shouldn't shock anybody, it's from Everneath, it's Nikki and Cole. Now, I know that Cole is ultimately the losing leg of that love triangle, and Nikki winds up with Jack, like I said just a minute ago, but... Still, the fact that he was a love interest at all is just gross because, again, he is a magical rapist. Like, that's that's all there is to say about him, really. He's a magical rapist. He lies to her. He abuses her. He manipulates her. He does this magical ritual to her, thinking that it will kill her, but then it turns out it doesn't, and that's just a, a happy accident on his part. Like, he, he would have gladly killed her if he needed to. Like... He's not a good person in any way, and the fact that the two of them had a real thing going on, even if he dies at the end to redeem himself, please note the quotes around the word redeem himself, is just, it's just gross. The runner-up for the worst romance I read this year is from Nightbane, which is the sequel to Lightlark, if you were unaware, and uh, that one is going to be Isla and Grimm. Grimm is also a magical rapist. <laughs> Why is this such a common thing? That's weird. Whatever. Not important. Uh, yeah, those are both books where one of the love interests in a love triangle is a magical rapist, but Grimm isn't as bad in Nightbane as Cole is in Everneath, so I guess, I, just, I, I don't know. He's not as bad. He's the runner-up. That's still a spot in the Hall of Shame. Worst protagonist I read this year? Give me a drum roll, everybody. <laughs> It's Everneath again. It's Nikki from Everneath. I hate Everneath. I really do. I, I, uh, again, if you haven't watched my video on it, j go watch it. Seriously, there's so much context you're missing here. But Nikki is literally a mass murderer at the end of the series, and it just it never even comes up. Like, like the last couple of chapters after she murders thousands of people, she never stops and goes, oh, wait, I just murdered thousands of people. And she n it'd be one thing if she thought about it and then found some way to justify it, because, you know, th there were some justifications, at least that I could think of, but she it just never even crosses her mind. She's a, a horrible person, and even though she started off as an okay protagonist, by the end she just, f no. The runner-up for the worst protagonist I read this year? Easily, easily, Violet Sorengale from Fourth Wing. Also, get it? She's a dragon rider. She soars on the wind. She's soaring on the wind. She's soaring on the gales. Soaring gale, do you get it? Yeah, 
that's that yeah that that name had more thought put into it than everything else in that book combined like fourth wing absolutely horrible for a lot of reasons violet's a bad person she's stupid she's selfish she's she doesn't you know mass murder people the way that uh nikki does but you know she does some questionable stuff and no one ever really calls her out for it she's also just amazing just because she's the main character so she's amazing at things and they try to make her disabled in order to make her like relatable and give her flaws but then her disability doesn't actually affect anything it's like no she's she she's horrible but she's not as bad as nikki and i mean she she at least has some personality that's something third place for the worst protagonist i read this year is again noah from leviathan like he he suffers from a lot of similar problems to uh violet sorengale where he's just amazing just because and he does morally questionable things but it's fine because the author agrees with the morally questionable things he does and the author doesn't have the self-awareness to acknowledge that the things he's doing are morally questionable it so you know that's all fine he's just amazing just because and he doesn't have much personality because of that he, he's getting married to his cousin it's like just a lot of stuff man a lot of stuff it it's hard to get through but you know again noah doesn't do as many bad things as the other two so he's slightly lower the best protagonist i read this year is prince roger mcclintock also from the empire of man series and man if you had told me that right at the beginning of the first book i don't think i would have believed you but his journey here is genuinely fantastic like i, I don't know if i'd call it a redemption arc per se but watching him go from a spoiled not entirely useless but mostly useless prince to being an actual emperor and being essentially a bloodthirsty barbarian who knows how to keep himself tempered at, at least when necessary is genuinely fascinating to watch and also just it, it's great you know i love seeing his journey and I, again i don't know if i call it a redemption arc per se but you could consider it one and if so it's probably the best one i've ever read or at least one of the best ones i've ever read and just i don't know watching him his journey was fantastic you know some protagonists are great from the beginning others have to grow on you and roger mcclintock definitely grew on me the best book series i read this year is the dark prophet saga aka orconomics because you know the first book is orconomics now i've only read the first two books here because I read them both as audiobooks, and the third one is out, but it doesn't have an audiobook yet, so I'm just, like, waiting for that to happen. Whenever it happens, it happens, <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm excited for the end, and, man, it's just, it's a great story. You know, it's not especially derivative of other adventure or fantasy stories I've read over the years, but at the same time, it still feels really familiar. You know, it's about a washed-up old adventuring hero named Gorm Ingerson who gets roped back into being a hero and has to go with this party on a quest and then that blows up and becomes a much bigger thing and a much bigger conflict in the second book and man it's just it's just great you know it has great humor it has fantastic satire of the real world not just real world you know economics and it's not surface level either it goes pretty deep but like real world economics it and uh, real world governments and stuff but it also pokes fun at and i don't know if i'd call it a parody per se but it does poke a lot of fun at uh like fantasy tropes and the way that rpgs work particularly dungeons and dragons because a lot of the world building here is based in broad strokes on dungeons and dragons and the worlds there it's just i, I don't know it's fantastic and it's really fun and lighthearted at first but then it has some really really dark twists and the story gets much more serious in fact this is one of the darkest things i read this year and i read the last couple of broken empire books this year <laughs> but you know it's not crazy over the top dark and that never overtakes the story you know like these characters are still the same characters we knew before and even if they're traumatized and have some serious issues not just in the past but in the present they are still the same goofy dudes we knew and after fantasy has largely been going in a darker and darker direction in the past like 15 years it is really nice to see something that is dark but it serves an actual purpose and it doesn't let the darkness overtake everything you know so dark prophet saga genuinely amazing fantasy books if you're looking for something fantasy at all give those a shot and if you find the humor or anything off-putting and you think it's just going to be silly and goofy throughout just 
read until the end of the first book, and then come back to me. The best protagonist with lightning powers I read this year. Oh, this is a three-way battle, because <laughs> for some reason this year I read three different books where the protagonist was a girl, a teenage girl, who has lightning powers. Or I guess technically one of them is 20 years old. But you know what? Close enough. You're all children to me. <laughs> but yeah, I read Struck, I read uh, Fourth Wing, and Red Queen. All of whom had protagonists with lightning powers for some reason. And all of which I didn't really know about going into it. Uh, and the best protagonist of those three is Mia Price from Struck. <laughs> Look, it's not a high bar to clear, but Mia was at least, you know, a, a, one, she was an actual character. She wasn't a total blank slate. And number two, she was likable enough and, you know, did good things and didn't kill a bunch of people for no reason or anything. Uh, second place is Violet from Fourth Wing because as awful as she is, when it comes to protagonists, I will take one that I hate over one that has no personality at all. And third place is Mare from Red Queen. Like, again, M Mare is, I guess, more likable than Violet, but there's just nothing to her. You know, she's just the main character girl, and she has lightning powers. So, yeah, I, Mia Price wins. Now, the runner-up for the worst book I read this year is gonna be Pariah. Yeah, I... When I put out a video on this, I, I said Pariah is the worst book I've read this year so far, and that was... That was good instincts, James, because you knew it was gonna get worse than that. And... Pariah's pretty bad, though. It, I, I don't blame you if you've never heard of it. It's basically about a bunch of people trapped in a building after the zombie apocalypse, and they're all slowly starving, and then one day a girl walks by, and the zombies are all just leaving her alone, and they want to know what's going on there. And that, that might sound intriguing, but they don't really do anything with it, because so, there's basically no plot here. Every character is an asshole. There's nothing in the way of identifiable themes or world building, because we don't know anything about what's going on outside of this very small area, which, I mean, that could be fine, but again, there's no plot, so there's like there's nothing to distract us there. But the real, the real sin of this book is just the way it's written, because that is actually disgusting. Like, t there's no easy way to put this. There's a scene in this book where one of the main characters describes a woman as sexy by comparing her to prisoners during the Holocaust. DISGUSTING! I'm not making that up. It just, like, when I read that line, I was still relatively early in the book, but I knew from that moment forward, like, okay, I'm gonna fucking hate this thing. And I was right, it didn't get better after that. I, I can't say it got worse than that, but it didn't get better either, so... Yeah, Pariah... Easily, easily the second worst book I read this year. And it's not a big jump from Pariah to the number one spot, I'll say that. And the absolute worst thing I read in 2023, th there's a couple of good guesses you could put here, but at the end of the day, I had to put it as Fourth Wing. Like, Fourth Wing is the worst thing I read this year. Like, to the point where I'm just not touching the sequels ever. I don't care if it would get me... A lot of attention or anything. I Number one, I don't want to give the people making this more money because that just encourages them. And number two, I just do not have the mental energy to go through that shit. I just, I just don't anymore. I, I hate Fourth Wing so much. There is pretty much nothing in that book worth praising. It's 500 pages and there's nothing good there. Like, it is just porn pretending to be young adult fantasy, pretending to be adult fantasy. Like, that, that's the simplest way I can think to describe Fourth Wing. Violet is, as I said earlier, stupid, selfish. She's disabled because she has uh, EDS, but that, that doesn't affect her that much, you know? And, I mean, sure, there are forms of EDS which are extremely debilitating, but the form she has isn't really that bad. And so she doesn't really come across as disabled, and even if she did, she just sort of powers through all of her obstacles, so there's nothing going on there. And she's just great at everything and gets hot boys just, just because. You know, if you're looking for porn, like, okay, there's smutty stuff in here, there's graphic sex scenes, but they don't come up until 370 pages in. 
So even if you're looking for that, it's a bad example of that sort of thing. Like, pe people got on me for calling it porn because, again, it takes forever for the porn to start, but, like, it's still porn, even if it takes forever for the porn to start, guys. I don't think I mentioned this in my video on it, but, you know, Violet, again, she's disabled, she's physically weak, as they put it, but she has lightning powers and she's a dragon rider, so... Couldn't they just have her fly around and rain lightning on their foes? You know, be like a fantasy version of an A-10 Warthog? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? W wouldn't that have been a way for her to work with her disability instead of just ignoring it? W that that would have been cool, in my opinion. But whatever, I guess nobody cares what I think. And then their government is just evil, but more than that, they're just stupid. Like, most of the stuff their government does that comes across- that's supposed to come across as evil just looks stupid. Like, for example, the Dragon Rider Academy, students are just allowed to murder each other for literally no reason. It's- it's not even like they have organized duels or anything. They're just allowed to murder each other whenever they want. For no reason. <laughs> and, uh, they also just go through stupidly dangerous, uh, testing. Like, n not even stuff that- could be dangerous, but there's some supervision and safety in the way, you know, to, like, teach you something. And it's just, if you fuck up really bad or get really unlucky, you die. It's just, like, stuff that is designed to kill you. And if you get lucky, you get past it and you learn nothing. You know, like, there's just so much dumb shit here, but probably the dumbest is that the main character is, you know, forced into this by her mother, but a lot of other people are you know, also conscripted or they volunteer for this academy, you know, to go through all this dangerous stuff so that they can become dragon riders. But then also the children of people who led a rebellion a while ago were also forced to become dragon riders and they were forced to do it as punishment. So number one, you're taking all these people who are a security risk and giving them the most powerful weapons in your kingdom, but also you're doing this as punishment but also you're just let, allowing your regular kids to do it at the same time. None of this makes sense. Absolutely none of this. And it becomes even more fucking nonsensical when you get to uh, the latter chunk of the book where Violet is like shocked to find out that her government is evil. I don't even know how her government's evil or what exactly they're doing that is evil. All I know is that they're apparently on the wrong side in the war that's going on, but I have no context in order to understand what's going on. So. Maybe people who have read the second book could explain that, but I don't care. I just fucking don't. And then, uh, you know, obviously, everybody tries to kill Violet just because, you know, again, she's the main character, she's the best. Like, it's just... Fourth Wing is just pure wish fulfillment, which isn't inherently bad, but the fact that it's not even trying, and the fact that people are hype, were hyping it up so much and talking about how amazing it is because, you know, it just gives them exactly what they want in the exact way that they want it all the time instantly. That just set me off. That just pushes all of my buttons. And you know what? Just, I, Fourth Wing deserves to be the bottom of the list here, okay? Because it is by far the worst thing I read this year. I, I don't care if people are gonna get salty at me about that, they're gonna go, oh, you only hate it because it's romance. Fuck you, okay? I have an hour-long video talking about all of the problems I have there, none of which are that it has a big focus on romance. Because it really doesn't even have a big focus on romance. Like, the main love interest is a guy named Zayden, who falls in love with Violet just because she's the fucking main character. Like, there's no moment in the book I can point to where they really fall in love and start to like each other. They just, th they each think the other is hot from the beginning. And then after a little while, Violet realizes, okay, Zayden isn't actively trying to kill me, so I guess he's fine. And then just, th they're in love now. Like, that's it. There is basically no romance here. It is fucking porn. It is wish fulfillment, okay? Like, if you, if you like it, just be honest with yourselves about what it is. So, uh, that's the end of that. Like, uh, another year has gone by. Uh, we're all a little bit older than we were last time I did this, but, you know, it's, uh, that's just life, you know? Time moves on whether we want it to or not. And in terms of books, yeah, 2023 could have been a lot better for me, but in my personal life, things went okay, and I hope the same can be said for many of you, you know? 
I finally live on my own, don't have to deal with roommates or family or anybody, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm here. But, you know, things also haven't been perfect. You know, I tried adopting a cat a while ago, but I just had so much anxiety about not being able to take proper care of him that I had to send him back and that broke my heart. But, you know, he got adopted. He has a decent family now and I, I wish him nothing but the best. And, I mean, in terms of YouTube as well, this is, uh, I had a bit of a iffy period during the summer, but I heard a lot of other people did too. And I realized uh, after that, where I, you know, made that video just saying, hey, I'm changing up some things on my channel, and I also took a bunch of advice from the people watching and used as much of it as I could, and things are looking up now, you know, channel's doing better, but I'm also realizing that being on YouTube is very much a push and pull between things I want to make and things that will sell. You know, like these things, these aren't mutually exclusive. There is overlap between them. And I think any YouTuber watching this can probably uh, identify a bit with this. But there, that overlap uh, is ideal. But for some people, there's only a little bit. And some people, there's a lot. You know, I didn't read Fourth Wing because I wanted to or because I cared about it at all. I read it because a lot of people wanted me to, so I was like, okay, fine, we'll check it out. And it, it was terrible, <laughs> you know? Red Queen wasn't as terrible, but again, I really only picked it up because, hey, I figured people wanted me to talk about it, and that was one of my best performing videos this year, you know? So I, it, it worked out okay, I'm not complaining too hard, but... I think that is a struggle that, even if you're not a YouTuber, every creative person has to deal with, or at least every person who does creative stuff professionally has to deal with. You know, what sells and what you want to make is not always the same thing. And, you know, ideally, you can make the overlap as big as possible, but it's never going to be 100%. But whether I succeed or fail, I'll always have you. <laughs> you know, I, I'll always have at least a couple of people who are into my stuff, and that that really does mean a lot, you know? And outside of YouTube, I was able to work on my own book a whole lot more. Uh, I didn't quite finish editing or anything, but, you know, that's life gets in the way sometimes. And I, I know I mentioned a while ago I wanted to write, like, a parody book, uh, like a parody young adult fantasy thing that wasn't, again, it wasn't a super obvious parody. It was a stealth parody, kind of like Swoon. But, uh... I wanted to do that for NaNoWriMo, and I realized I was spending a weird amount of time on it, and so I just decided, okay, that time should just be spent on my other book that I'm writing, so that's just what I did. Maybe I'll get to it one day. I do have, like, an actual outline and everything written, but hey, uh, life happens. And I can confidently say that throughout all of 2023, I was just always tired, but I can also say that I was always progressing. You know? I took a lot of time to try and be better in a lot of different ways and I hope all of you did too so uh, if you're watching this I hope you have a uh, Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays whatever you may celebrate or may not celebrate have a Happy New Year and here's to a bunch more books hopefully better ones in 2024 goodbye hello people watched until the end why <laughs> why would why would you do that Nobody watches to the end of YouTube videos, but you know what? Thanks for doing that. I appreciate it. And a huge thanks to all my patrons whose names you see right here. They are Oppo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santotis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Chibs Ahoy, Dan Anselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, Jalal Dalul, James M., Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Microphone, Mistboy, Mitzi Mona, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych XS, Celine, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, Vimex Zol, and Wesley. Oh my goodness, I love all of you so much. If you want your name on here, then consider donating to my Patreon page. You also get early access to videos and some exclusive content, which, you know, if you actually like me for whatever reason, that, uh, you know, that's probably beneficial. And if you don't feel like doing that, then, you know, just like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel. That, the, the, you know, all, all that stuff. Goodbye.